My lord and gentlemen. Centuries of sound. Welcome to the Centuries of Sound radio podcast for 1905. This show originally went out on Cambridge 105 Radio in August 2019 and features guest appearances from three teachers who had been working at the summer camp I was running at the time, all three of whom had clearly already had a pretty good night when we started recording. Centuries of Sound is a project I undertake in my spare time. The only financial compensation I get for this is through Patreon, and right now it's just about enough to keep me going, though it's pretty tight. If you enjoy these shows, and especially the full mixes, which are of course the main deal here, please consider coming to patreon.com slash centuries of sound and signing up for five dollars a month you get lots of extra bonus content for that or you could help out by sharing with a friend or relative i understand that many of the people listening to 1930s music are not particularly tech savvy and may not have heard of patreon so you could tell one of them anyway this is 1905 enjoy the show Centuries of Sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. Welcome to Centuries of Sound, the show where we use original archive audio to travel back in time to a year in history. This year we're going to 1905. My name's James, and today we have in the studio... Adam. Joanne. (laughs) And Dominic. So we have uh, three guests today, crowded studio. So what do you guys know about the year 1905? Russian Revolution. Russian Revolution. Revolution. Yep, that's one thing that happened. Anything else? We're going to find out a lot, I feel. And for that I'm grateful. So we just heard Arthur Pryor's band. What did you make of Arthur Pryor's band? Brass. Brass. Jolly. Optimism. Optimism. Mm. Optimism. I think they were working towards optimism. It's not like they felt optimism, but they were trying to create something. Well, that kind of music, it's kind of brass band music, but what you can see is they're moving towards... uh, We're moving into the kind of ragtime era now, so they're doing lots of melodies, kind of ragtime melodies, where you've got two different rhythms playing off against each other so that's the the kind of progression we've got in music so it's going from brass bands to ragtime and then it's going to be kind of dance ragtime and then jazz music so there's a line going from brass bands to jazz anyway let's uh let's have a listen to something else this is a kind of spooky number by the edison concert band uh this time we have uh wax cylinders 
and we have uh, the first shellac discs as well. Um, so this uh, this is a cylinder, and it's lots of the cylinders are made by the Edison Company, who are the people who make cylinders. So this is the Edison concert band, and it's called Skeleton Dance. Later, it was used for the first uh, silly symphony made by Walt Disney, with uh, kind of skeletons dancing around a graveyard. Ooh, I imagine xylophones. Yeah, xylophones Ooh. on rib cages, that kind of thing. All right, so here we have Skeleton Dance. So what did you make of the spooky sounds of the Edison Symphony Orchestra then? Not as xylophonetic. Xylophonic? Xylophonic, not as xylophonic <laughs> as, as we'd expected. I was yeah. expecting more, you know, I was in percussion back in school. I know all about my xylophones. Mm-hmm. Um, and Gotham Spills, did not. There's a lot of xylophone music in these early days. Mm. Famous xylophone players. You don't get a lot of famous xylophone players now. So it's a bit of a difference there. It's a sad time. Mm-hmm. I want more. Let's listen to a bit of drama on uh, on uh, disc. This is a production of uh, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Oh, because uh, you, you will find out straight away, basically. Um, oh, and Maybe it, this is knowledge of drama, this is okay. some this is some hardcore ham. They have ransacked London in vain for the drug which has been the cause of all my misery. Soon I shall be transformed into the terrible creature that is within me. This then is the last time Henry G. Hill can see his own face or seek his own thoughts. Ah, I go to sleep at Peak Hill and wake up this time. For will I die on the gallows or will I have the courage to take this poison? What's this I feel? The demon is coming. I disappear. <laughs> Ah, oh, Sam Morgan! The noise offends me here! <laughs> they come for me! They're going to take me to the gallows! But I don't die on the gallows! Hold up, hold up! I feel two people already! Here goes for the third! He kill! He kill! I've always told you I'd kill him! <laughs>
is. Yeah, obviously you know what that is, yeah? No. It's Doc, Dr. Jekyll and oh Mr. Goodness. Hyde. The well, bit of a, was that okay. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde speaking yeah, together? Yeah, that, that he, was, he was going from one to the other. Three different voices, but the same actor. Should have been obvious. Yeah, no, yeah. No, wasn't at all. No. Nah. Let's move to some different countries around the world. This is a year when we've got loads of different things from different places. Most years before, it's all American. We don't really have like even British recordings. And this year, yeah, we have one. We have one. But uh, let's go first to Mexico. Uh, who speaks Spanish? Adam speaks some Spanish. Not really. So, oh, well, some Spanish. Hey. This is Banda de Zapadores de Mexico. So, that's the band of sappers of Mexico. Yeah, I mean, sure. Why so, not? What's, what's a sapper is the question. Is it, wait, wait. Sapper with an S? S A P P E R. Sapper. The person who S-A-P-P-E-R. digs a hole and makes an explosion. R? That's it, yeah. Right, okay. All right, in, in, uh, in Spanish, Zapadores. Z A P. Well, yes, apparently. There was enough sappers to make a band and they recorded some music. Multiple. This is Banda de Zapadores de Mexico with a La Paloma. Okay. I know that. That's the pigeon or the dove. The pigeon or the dove. Which? Which they, they make a distinction. exploded. They are the same bird, to be fair. There you go. But one's I mean, nice and the other one's a rat. Yeah, but that's, that's, the, that's the kind of pigeon. I like a collar. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's the noise of a pigeon. <laughs> yeah, exactly, a pigeon. Here we go. La Paloma danza por la banda de zapadores de México. Monograma Edison. So that was the Banda de Zapatoros de Mexico with La Paloma. We reckon that that might be mariachi music. What do we reckon? Apparently mariachi music dates back to at least the 18th century. So that could be an early example of recorded mariachi bands. It was quite sombre. Was it? I find What's that mean? Just, well, I think, mariachi music in general doesn't sound yeah, somber. No, that's why I, th- I found it was odd, because you were talking about mariachi, and then I thought, ooh, that's a touch somber for, for me, at least. Like, my impression of Spanish music in general... Well, Mexican music. <laughs> well, but it's got a Spanish influence, obviously. And vice versa. Okay. Yeah, but, like, you know, flamenco is always about, like, oh, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. <laughs> flamenco is often a description of the hardships faced by the uh, Kitano people. And also, you've got <clears throat> uh, Semana Santa, 
which is essentially like a huge cultural thing all over Spain, but particularly in the south. And all of that is very funereal, kind of the same kind of instrumentation, just somber dirges. Like the kids in my classes were like, play some, play some Semana Santa music, Adam. Oh, what one do you want? Uh, I think in English its title is Grief. So grief. <laughs> you want to listen to a wordless piece of processional music called Grief in class. All right, children. Sure. Wow. Um, so, yeah, like having that kind of somber element to it seems very in keeping with the... Uh, I, I, I just, I'm glad I wasn't just completely out of touch there. Thank you, Adam. On the other hand, I might be just completely merging two cultures which don't actually overlap at this point. So let's, uh, let's move on to actual Spain. And uh, this is uh, the okay. Well, well, we will move on from Spain, away from Spain after this. So uh, use your moment here. Right, who becomes the expert then? Who becomes the expert? Well, we'll see. Uh, those two Spanish things. <laughs> Collar doves. We're not going to discuss any further. Sorry, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So this is the uh, trio instrumental Ariaga. Uh, Ariaga. What is Ariaga? Good question. Yeah. Yes. Well. Ariaga is an opera house in Bilbao. Oh, okay. mm. and uh, Bilbao. where's Bilbao? Bilbao North is the uh, country. It's nice. Yeah. Um, so, and it's a composer called Juan Cristomo de Ariaga, the Spanish Mozart. He was apparently. Uh, so, this is a, an instrumental trio from the uh, Ariaga Opera House in Spain. And uh, they're playing a, a Spanish opera by Thomas Breton. of sound on Cambridge 105 radio so what did you make of that this the uh, trio instrumental Ariaga you, you were saying it sounded kind of like a music box being played yeah yeah, yeah. like you know crank the handle make it faster and then it, it, it got slower and as it got slower it, the sound I don't know if discordant is the right adjective but it sounded less obviously pleasant and I enjoyed that Okay. Apparently, I don't like obvious pleasures. <laughs> Not non-obvious pleasures does do sound better than obvious pleasures. That's fair enough. So there's a website that I go to, which is called Russian Records, and Russian Records is is a bizarre website in Russia where people upload like records produced at this time, not always Russian ones, and uh, without much details. And I have to kind of translate things into Russian and back. So I've got I've got hold of this, and it claims to be from Spain. It's called um, Los Montegrins de la Fontiela de Montegri, which I've put into Google, and it Can shows I nothing at all. see that written down? Uh, no. Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure how we could arrange that. Quite a crap idea. No chance. 
Um, no, no, Los Montegrins de la... I, I can slide down, Adam, and then you can, like, loom over. Look, Look you can probably pronounce it as well as I can. Yeah. Los Montegrins de la fun, Funchella. That, that's, that's, okay, man. That's, that's way Sleep. Italian. Sorry, Sleep. my mistake. Oh, yeah, sorry, okay. man. I, 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 I Squeeze around. Uh, is that Spanish? More or less. Los. Well, kind of, but you'd expect an E between the N and the S. Like Los Montegrines de la Fon... Fon... Fonsella? I don't know. Because L would be a, yeah. an, an article. It's odd, but isn't the it? The double L in Spanish isn't. Like an L is a Aja from from there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So right. many English teachers. The Montego. Lots of English teachers. This, exactly. this, this, look, this looks more. I know, I know. The D is is definitely Italian. This doesn't look actually like a Spanish. Okay. This is the mysterious, not Spanish, possibly Spanish song about a queen of the flowers. <laughs> Yeah. There are actions that we can't see, but you can hear them in the music. There is a supposedly attractive woman involved. In a red dress, for sure. Yeah. I, I'll admit red dress. That's I think it was, I think it should be a, a black and white movie, most likely in 1905, yeah, yeah, surely. A sinister man. The man is definitely sinister. I, that's, that's me. Is he the kind who ties them to the railroad tracks and kind of thing? He's got like a big hat. I think it's more sinister than moustache. It's it's earlier and more sinister. I was thinking less sinister. I was thinking more like uh, like Tubman from Maltese Falcon, but just in a silent movie. Somebody who's sinister and dangerous, but at the same time, kind of you know, jovial. Oh, I was thinking more of that Sherlock Holmes where the South African drags her to the altar. I don't know that one, but. I would, yeah, like somebody being plied with drink while somebody else sneaks around in the background. Oh. It's like, oh, yeah, I get yeah, the sneaking yeah. around in the background. Here's, here's a drink over here. I'll just pour it into your face while this person, like, you know, creeps around behind you. That kind and of then uh, uh, unconvincing ghost flaps around in the background. <laughs> An unconvincing sure. ghost. Yeah, right. 1905. Is this, is this a film you've seen? Or is this. I'm, we're just inventing it now, aren't we? Wow. We're going to write it and then next year it'll be in the cinema. Uh, wow. No, this Thursday. Um, let's have a listen to some uh, classical music. We're going to get cut, kind of into classical solos now. Um, this is uh, 
Pablo de Salasate. This also sounds this is like a Spanish name. Yes, it definitely is. Uh, it's uh, Martin Meloton Pablo de Salasate. Okay, I can't say it. So Pablo Salasate. Uh, he's a Spanish violinist and composer of the Romantic period. Pablo Salasate? Is there an accent? Or? I think that's probably right, yeah. Okay. okay, good. We're on the Spanish section, so you can have your help here. That's good. Um, <laughs> I mean, your pay, Adam. Congratulations. Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Right, so, uh, Mar- <laughs> Martin Meliton Pablo de Salazate y Navas Coes. Does that sound right? Oh, yes. Say yes. yes. Yes, yes. Well, he was a Spanish violinist and composer of the Romantic period. He lived from 1844 to 1908. So this is a pretty old guy who's uh, yeah. going to die a few years later. Close to the end of his life. Yeah, and we've got a recording of him. So, uh, a swan song. Yeah, Caprice Basque, Op 24. Here it is. Okay, so that was Pablo de Salasate. Probably got his name wrong several times there. A uh, bit of uh, classical violin there, uh, one of his own compositions. What, what do you make of uh, Pablo? He's uh, getting towards the end of his life. Still, still sounds like he can, he can really play it. Yeah, no, I, I, I really liked it. I, I you know, I thought uh, it was quite dynamic. You know, a lot of changes, changes in sound and and, and you know, like. Um, the plucking I really enjoyed it <laughs> I always like a plucked violin I don't know why I just do I like plucked violins mm. it's like a guitar reference Spanish guitar but it seems more impressive when you're doing it on a violin just because it mm. seems like it's a violin so you shouldn't do it yeah it's not meant for that so if you could make a good sound out of it you're hats even more impressive so um, let's go to Russia I've talked about Russian records a bit already um, this is a soprano from Russia I've been listening to lots of stuff I don't like opera Okay. As a whole, how do you feel about opera? It, you can you can talk in it takes the time. microphone, which is I a bit over here. It. Don't hate it. Don't hate it. No, opera takes time because you actually have to sit down and properly listen to the entire thing. I like the magic flute. I feel uninformed. Sometimes I like Wagner and I feel guilty about it. Mm. <laughs> you don't need to feel guilty about this to Wagner. I mean, actually, I don't, but... I mm. spent two years living in Verona and in Verona they have the... A fabulous uh, place where you can go and see opera, and I absolutely loved it every time I've gone. Oh. Yeah, so, the couple of times I've been, it's been a good time, but I've never listened to it on my own, apart from when I'm trawling through 500 recordings of tenors from Russia, which are awful. Last time on the show, we had a version of this song by a castrato. 
this is she's not a castrato she's a, just she? a regular woman uh, Maria A. Mikhailova um, so it's a this is her version of it let's, let's hear her Okay, so there's Maria A. Mikhailova, accompanied by Maria Hamovitskaya, piano and violin, uh, with Ave Maria. So, what did you make of that? It's, I think she has a much higher range than the castrato we heard last week. <laughs> Put it like that. It wasn't the most powerful voice. Well, it's difficult, the recordings at this point. Yeah, and also more say, feminine. Or is that just me? We spoke about this the other day in a non-on-air context, though, like recording technology didn't really capture the full range of a performer's voice at this time. Like, we're probably hearing mm. a more yeah. limited version of what she was really capable of. Yeah, the high the high frequencies don't get captured. Did you also get the force? Or Whoa. The amplitude? Really? I was expecting the low frequencies didn't get <laughs> yeah, captured. Was Both. That was high. Both. Both the high and low don't really get captured. So if you can imagine the higher ones being much higher than that, that's what she would have sounded like she was breaking some glasses you know there's something almost almost ghostly about it you know you're listening to something and you think like I haven't really felt this with anything else we've heard today but like oh boy everyone who made this is dead <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> like it, it really felt like that I do you know? feel like she was expressing more emotion than some of those guys earlier I think it's easier to express emotion with your voice than it is with an instrument yes oh absolutely yeah and I guess so, so. I guess so yeah I mean, well, that sounds fair enough, I suppose. To express, but easier for other people to interpret, I think, often. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I'm quite okay. verbally minded. Like, I can hear yes. like somebody playing music in a sad way, but I won't really feel the same unless they sing, like, I'm sad, I'm really sad. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, and then I get it. I'm like, oh, you're sad. I understand. Not something I'm going to listen to again. Not going to lie. Enjoyed it. Not going to enter into my regular rotation. It's fine. <laughs> That's fair enough. Fair enough, of course. Okay, uh, let's have a bit more. This is our our last classical selection of the day, except for the the closing number, actually. But um, this is uh, Virgilio Ranzati. So this is Italian we're getting onto now. So different kind of area of expertise here, and it's the intermezzo from Rural Honor. So, uh, what what do you know about Italian Rural Honor? Um, Watch yourself.
So that was uh, Virgilio Ranzato, the intermezzo from Rural Honour. I feel that's a uh, famous classical piece. I, I definitely recognise it. I don't know about you. Yeah. yeah, but no one's quite sure where it came from. Everyone's relatively sure they recognise it, but not from where. Might have been on an advert, possibly, at some point. Are you going to have a, a listener write in? Yeah, if you if you would like to write in, Please. it's uh, centuriesofsoundmail at gmail.com or james at centuriesofsound.com. They both go to the same place. Uh, 1905, if you picture the world of 1905, what kind of things do you picture? In terms of like technology, things like that. The uh, modern world of 1905. Nascent motor cars? Yeah, okay, right. well done. Yeah. See, cool. he, uh, listeners, he cannot see my screen, so he doesn't know what's coming up. Exactly. Machine gun? No, n- not not machine guns. That's ten years later. Not yet. Not yet. Machine guns, really? Okay. Apparently they were invented before the first yes World War. Yes and no. Okay. Anyway, cars. What kind of cars did they have in 1905? Funky ones. They had uh, cool ones. If you think about like Mr. Toad driving around the countryside in his yeah, car, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. Yep. We are a couple of years after Wind in the right. Willows. Open tops. I don't think any of them had tops. There you go, exactly. At that yeah. point. That's why they were open. There's always novelty songs about technology, so this is a novelty song about cars. Um, most of the novelty songs about cars this time have the cars as very dangerous things that keep crashing into people. That's their concept of cars. So generally, not trying to tell them. This not not an advert. I think this song is good because it play. You can hear like the they kind of recreate the sounds of cars using their instruments. You you you'll hear what I mean. Let's let's have a listen. Now, gentlemen, you have your instruction complete. But I would again call your attention to rules two and three. Keep to the left when overtaking, and give due warning of your approach by horn or trumpet. Get ready, number one, go. So that was the Edison Concert Band with the Auto Race, and uh, people were saying it sounds like Wacky Races, and I have to agree. Yeah. Did you like Wacky Races? For sure. For sure. sure. <laughs> Catch the pigeon. You, Catch the pigeon was an entirely different show. I think you find. Uh, um, yeah. I mean, I liked it, but you know, it, it did bother me just for the logical inconsistency of, of Dick Darcy and Mutley being so far ahead that they could stop and lay a trap. And not just continuing. They could have won every wacky race. Every single wacky race. Mm. And yet, for some reason, they were just so insecure. Wait, maybe this is a deeper cartoon than I thought. It's <laughs> they were who- so insecure. <laughs> hubris, isn't it? Yeah. To win. They'd be like, look, I've got to spend all my time sabotaging the efforts of others. Yeah. Oh, well, that's because he had a moustache. And everyone with a moustache does that. Yeah. Who can do Mutley's laugh? Not me. I can't. It was oh, very that's wheezy. A big ask, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Like, oh, my voice is too high and reedy, I'll try I'm afraid. James will edit it out because it's not going <laughs> to. That's pretty good. That, yeah, that's wow. quite good. Centuries of Sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. We've been all around the world, yeah. We've been to America, 
been to Mexico, been to Spain, been to Russia and Italy. Let's come close to home. Um, one of the, I'd say, maybe the most famous British recording artist of the pre-First World War era. Who's that? Do you know? <laughs> you don't know. I'm that just guy, you know, That guy? Steve. Steve? Glenn. No, Glenn. not Steve. Glenn. Not Glenn. Derek. Oak. Dave. Oh, no. no. Oliver. No, no, no. So the most famous recording star of this era was a Mr. Harry Lauder. Have you ever heard of Harry Lauder? Made me feel sad, James. Mm, no. no. Why do you feel sad? So you're. I didn't say it's Harry Lauder yeah. now. No. Harry Lauder had a whole life and career where he was the most famous British recording <laughs> artist before 1905. And now, like, <laughs> no one knows. Here we no are. one listens to the kind of music that he made anymore. Well, let me, let me tell you about Harry Lauder, okay? So he was a Scottish singer and comedian, and he's popular in musical and vaudeville, and internationally famous. And he was described by Sir Winston Churchill as Scotland's greatest ever ambassador. So he was the most famous Scottish person until like the 80s or something. He, if you, I think, 80s. I would say if you talk to Scottish people who know about their history and culture, they will know about Harry Lauder because he's the, the guy who made the Scottish <coughs> cliches uh, come to life. Oh, so they may not like Harry Lauder. Right. They may have mixed feelings about, and later he was Sir Harry Lauder. He was he was knighted when musicians were not often knighted. Let's let's have a listen to Harry Lauder. This is I love a lassie. <laughs> I love a lassie, a bonny hillin' lassie. If you seen her, you would fancy her as well. I met her in September, put the question in November, I'm soon here or to myself. Her father has consented, I'm feeling quite contented, I've went and sealed the bargain with a kiss. <laughs> I sit and weary, weary, when I think about my dearie, and you'll always hear me singing this. <laughs> I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She's as pure as the lily in the dell. And she's as sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather. Mary, my Scotch bluebell. <laughs> I love a lassie. A bonny hillin' lassie, she can warble like the mavis in the dell. She's an angel every Sunday, but a jolly lass on Monday, and as modest as her namesake the bluebell. And she's nice and neat and tidy, and I meet her every Friday, that's a very special nicht I wouldn't miss. I'm enchanted, I'm enraptured, since my heart's a darling captured. She's just intoxicated me with bliss. I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She's as pure as the lily in the dell. And she's as sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather. Mary, my Scotch. Bluebell. <laughs> I think, I think this is her. Wait, hold your tongue a minute. No, it's a rabbit. <laughs> I think, I think I see her nude. Wait. Wait. Wait a half a minute now. Wait, just wait till you see her. You'll see her the nude. Just, no, wait, no. Wait. And mind I'm telling some of you chaps here when you do see her. <laughs> I don't want to stand here and bounce up with her, but mind I'm telling you. <laughs> I love a lassie, a bonny, bonny lassie. She's as pure as the lily in the dell. And she's as sweet as the heather, the bonny purple heather. 
Slightly higher pitch. I'm saying he's like <laughs> Johnny Scottish. Cash, but a Scottish <laughs> cliche factory instead. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how well he stands up now. He's kind of. It's probably he's dead. He probably doesn't stand up at all. Harry Lauder. You can prop him up. And everyone else apart from three Japanese ladies is dead from 1905. I'm sorry to say. Three Japanese ladies, one French lady. That's who's alive from 1905. We're in the era where people are still alive. They know it. Aren't they saying that 110 year olds are lying though? And over the 110 year olds, that was the well, thing. That was that thing in South America. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, it's this is news to me. We, we've been all around the world, like I say, but this is kind of not the mainstream music we usually hear. Um, and I'm going to play you the biggest selling recording artist of his day. This is the Elvis of the pre First World War era, King of the Ragtime Singers. Arthur Collins. This is called The Preacher and the Bear, and this is his biggest hit single, so got to, got to play it. His biggest hit single is called The Preacher and the Bear. The Preacher and the Bear. He doesn't, he doesn't nobody was always on his mind or no shit like that. No, no. It's just, sorry. It's a song, literally. It's a song, literally, it's about... A swear, it's about a preacher and a bear. It's, about, it's very literally about a preacher and a bear. It is literally... his biggest hit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we don't want love. I mean, what he, a time to be he alive. did. Um, I mean, it's his biggest what? hit at the time, but people remember these days like uh, "Hello, my baby." You know, "Hello, my baby." Hello, hello. A preacher went out a hunting was on one Sunday morning. Of course, it was against his religion, but he took his gun along. He shot himself some very fine quail and one big measly hare. And on his way returning home, he met a great big grizzly bear. The bear marched out in the middle of the road, and he walked with the coon, you see. The coon got so excited that he climbed up a persimmon tree. The bear sat down upon the ground, and the coon climbed out on the limb. He cast his eyes to the Lord in the skies, and his words he said to him, Oh, Lord, didn't you deliver Daniel from the lion's den? Also deliver Jonah from the belly of the whale, and then three Hebrew children from the fiery furnace, for the good book to declare. Now, Lord, if you can't help me, for goodness sake, don't you help that bear. Now, Mr. Bear, let you and I reason this thing out together, eh? Nice bear. Good old bear. If I should give you just one nice, good, juicy bite, would you go away? Well, I'll stay right here. Oh, Lord, didn't you deliver Daniel from the lion's den? Also deliver Jonah from the belly of the whale and then three Hebrew children from the fiery furnace for the good book to declare. Now, Lord, if you can't help me, for goodness sake, don't you help that bear. sort of reminiscent of my, me listening to my granddad's records and it being like please Mr Custer and like talking about the Red Indians and like yeah it's a lot of that similar like it's yeah stuff like that okay I know what you mean it's really kind of um I don't know the, we have to uh, I have to apologise for the racist language obviously in it oh. because there's a lot worse than that out there that's all I can say and this is the biggest hit of this decade basically this song <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a huge hit. I love that the biggest hit of the decade is nothing to do with love or no. any yeah. kind of like what we would consider now a generally relatable experience. It's about a man going out hunting and also he meets a bear. Yeah, I mean that is that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's good. That's pretty cool. I wish there were a few less of the racial epithets in it. Yeah. Okay. No. no <laughs> I'm not saying it's a perfect okay. song. There's 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 things I don't like about it. Just more songs about Maybe bears. Maybe a lot of things. Yeah. Well, the Teddy Bear's Picnic was written around this time, 
But funnily enough, it had no lyrics until like oh. 20 years later. Yeah, uh, because teddy bears were invented in around this year. Was it 1904, it's 1903? Teddy because he refused to shoot a bear. Yeah, although the... The first canned hunt. The, the true story was that the, the bear was later te- was taken away somewhere else and shot. He just didn't want to do it in front of the other bear. Yeah, yeah it wasn't... It's, he didn't want it in front of another bear. Yeah, he didn't want to shoot the didn't... baby bear in front of the mummy bear. Oh. So he shot them both separately. Yeah, it's not doesn't sound so good, basically, does it? Nice to know that can hunt. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Roosevelt's a weird figure because he's got lots of very cool progressive policies, and uh, he's one of the best presidents in some senses. But also, he's uh, way too macho and just loved war. He thought war was the solution to everything, basically. So it's, there's some good side, but there's some awful side, obviously. And the, the hunting, I'm, I'm not a fan. Um, let's hear a comedy record. Comedy doesn't really translate so well through the years. Oh, that last thing translated amazingly. Yeah. It, 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 I guess situational comedy, perhaps. It's, 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 a, it's a song made, after, made out of comic limericks. So um, the limericks are not that funny, but it's, it's good to hear what made people laugh at the time. So let's hear. This is uh, Edward M. Favor with Folder or Lol. I've just learned a comic DDT from some of my friends in the city. The voices are short, and I think that you ought to admit that the chorus is pretty. There was a young lady in Pella, fell in love with a bow-legged fella. This husky young chap made her sit in his lap, but she fell straight through into this hella. Bill Jones was the son of a brewer. Saw a girl and he thought that he knew her. He lifted his hat and she hit him a bat and he lit on his ear in the sewer. There was an old lady in Wooster, was annoyed very much by a rooster. She cut off his head until he was dead and now he don't throw like he used to. There was a young miss from Decatur who went to play in the theatre. The poor little thing, when she started to sing, got hit with a rotten tomato. Another young miss from Fall River was sent out to purchase some liver. She went to a show and blew all her dough, and her parents will never forgive her. There was a young man from Moonsocket, had a watch and a chain and a locket, saw the races one day and when he came away all he had was his hand in his pocket. There was a young girl from Pawtucket, had a bottle as big as a bucket, she filled it with oats and some tough billy goats sneak right up behind her and took it. You know what? I like the rhymes with um, manure and sewer. Manure and sewer. Because I've also had that one with my own second name. So yeah, I get it. I get it. And I, you were sewer manure. Like I like it. Oh. Don't want to dox yourself on the internet though. No. That. <laughs> it touches me as sort of cliche late 70s Irishman from an American perspective uh, maybe like I can remember that guy from a Columbo episode <laughs> okay I know what you mean I know what you mean this is a, a Czech American uh, band leader called Bohemir Krill and uh, he was a, a trombone soloist as well and uh, what happened in these days is we have the kind of bands that have been going around for a long time for example, uh, Sousa's band, but then you get a, a soloist who kind of shows off on their uh, trombone or cornet, and they kind of take over a song. And uh, Bohemian Creole, that was his, that was his standard. That's what he did. And uh, now he got his own band to play as well. So this is uh, Bohemian Creole with King Carnival. <laughs>
Okay, so that was uh, Bohemian Krill with King Carnival. Um, what did you make of that after the long introduction? Fantastic name. Bohemian Krill. Yeah, really. Just... It's a typical kind of Czech name. I, I, when I was teaching in the Czech Republic, I had quite a few Bohemians. Yeah. I, mean, oh, I, was, I was playing as a krill, I think. Yeah, krill. Was krill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr. Krill. Mr. Krill. Adam yeah. Krill. I would be much happier with that than I am with my... Real surname. Yes. Real name. I'm not going to put it's anonymous. Um, exactly. K- 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 All of these opinions are anonymous. K-R-Y-L is how you spell krill. Oh, Even better. I was thinking C-R-I-L, but K-R-Y-L. I was thinking perfect. double L. So you you impressed with his... Uh, uh, trombone skills not particularly is this the, like sort of the early mass market of an individual I mean sort of leading on to Marilyn Monroe like she would dominate a film and they could flock it as Marilyn Monroe's film yeah I mean like these 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 kind of soloists these are these are bridging like ragtime into kind of it's kind of a dead end in a sense because they're kind of bringing things forward in a way that didn't really carry on but then you do get soloists again in jazz. So it kind of leaps a bit, but it kind of influences it a bit, I'd say. Uh, let's move back to Russia. This is the Harmonies Orchestra of V.S. Varshavsky with Kamarinskaya. Uh, this is a Harmonies Orchestra. You might be expecting an orchestra. You'll be surprised. Um, yeah, so there's a bit of uh, that's the harmonies orchestra of V.S. Varshavsky. I think we'll find he's not an orchestra; he's a guy with an accordion. Russian accordion music and ambition and ambition. Yeah. Yes, accordion and ambition. Yeah, he labels himself consistently as an orchestra. I've got several of his recordings, and it's all just a harp, a, an accordion. But it's it's good. I like his. Uh, it shows belief. I mean, any mm. man who's prepared to stand up and say I'm an orchestra. Where should we go to next, guys? Let's go to India. Sure. So well, this, is, go, this is an Indian guitar instrumental called Pilu. Mm-hmm. And the performer is Professor Barkatullah Khan. Ooh. Yeah, so uh, it's a professor. Um, I think in these days we had kind of professors of piano. 
would be like the name for an expert in piano. They'd say a professor of piano. So I think he's a professor in the sense that he's a professional musician who teaches other musicians. Um, so yeah, Professor Barkutala Khan with uh, Pillu, an Indian guitar instrumental. So you quite like that bit, do you yeah, think? Yeah, no, I think I like it regardless of just a little bit of the jankiness of it. Jankiness, yeah. Jankiness is, uh... is the... Can I have a definition on janky? <laughs> <laughs> janky, janky is uh, slightly off, off par, off, off beat, off uh, a bit discordant. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, then I agree, yeah. A bit janky. It, it had a distinct jankiness, but I did enjoy it. Yeah. More for its jankiness than in spite of its jankiness. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Enjoyably janky. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, um, is it on a guitar? Do you think that sounds like a guitar? I wonder if it's another instrument that looked a bit like a guitar. What do you think some people mis misnamed a guitarist? Mm. It's string, so we'll just call that a guitar and then... Tata. Possibly, quite I possibly. No, if some of the... Like we were talking about earlier with the vocals, maybe some of the sound is being cut off by the recording equipment. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. No, it says instrumental in the name. So I think... Well, I'm not saying a vocal oh. was cut off. I mean, just like maybe okay. it sounded more obviously sitarish until mm. it was put on a wax cylinder or something. And suddenly it's like, well, mm. suddenly it's less distinguishable from other string instruments. Yeah. Quite possibly. String instruments, plucky instruments. Plucky stringed instruments. Plucky string. string is the word you're looking Stringy, for. Plucky. Pluck stringed. String 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 is fine. String okay, is fine. Sorry. Yeah, that's good. Um okay, let's let's have a listen to um we, we heard previously uh Bohemir Krill, he's a, a band leader and also a soloist. That's another example. This is Arthur Pryor. Now Arthur Pryor he was uh the leader of Sousa's band. Do you know John Philip Sousa? It's the king of marching bands in the late Victorian era in America. Uh, every town had its own marching band, and they played John Philip Sousa music. It was the it was the pop music of its day. And um, yeah, you know the Monty Python theme song. Oh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you know what John Philip yes. Sousa sounds like then. Exactly, James, of course. Yeah. Okay. Know okay. Know right. Good. Yeah, good. Well, um, yeah, actually, yeah. So anyway, uh, John Philip Sousa he refused to record anything. He said it was canned music. Uh, he didn't believe in it. And he hated it. So uh, his band went and recorded without him because they wanted the money. 
and uh, the band leader in the in the 1890s was a Mr. Arthur Pryor, who suddenly realised he could start doing solos and become very popular doing like cool solos over the top of their music when Ragtime came along. At this point, he's got his own band and is starting to be a bit boring because he keep, he's, he's kind of taking a step back and they're becoming a normal band. Anyway, this is kind of one of the last ones where he does a solo on top of it and it's got a good name. It's called Razaza Mazaza. R-A-Z-A-Z-Z-A M-A-Z-Z-A-Z-Z-A Razaza Mazaza. So that was Arthur Pryor's band with Razaza Mazaza, a typical kind of uh, a band piece. I don't know if you call them a brass band anymore at this stage, from the uh, 1910s, what, 1900s. So what, what do you make of that? Is that what you would expect from this time more than the other things we've heard? Yes, I'm more American, if that strikes me. Yeah. What kind of picture do you have in your head from listening to that kind of music? Uh, Democratic Party conference. Mm-hmm. Yes, I just read what's come next on the screen. Um, yeah, well, yeah. Arthur, okay. Arthur Pryor later was a Democratic Party politician. It's true, <laughs> in his later life. So, it's certainly a bit less interesting than most of what we've heard. Mm-hmm. Like, um, very much a song that, sorry, not a song, piece of music that did not live up to its title. Razaza Mazaza was the best. Razaza Mazaza sounds like the best song in the world. That was far. Oh, so well, you were talking earlier about how he was. Was it this guy who was taking that's, a step back? He's taking a step like... back. Not so much solos now. So okay, yeah. yeah then he, he, I get the impression he took quite a large step back and just sort of mm. watched that one happen. Centuries of Sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. You've been listening to Centuries of Sound on Cambridge 105 Radio. I've been James, and today I've been joined by Adam, Joanne. And Dominic. If you like what you've heard, please come along to our website at centuriesofsound.com where you can hear mixes for every year from 1853 through to 1916 at this point. We are almost in the jazz age. And also mixes for the years uh, 2016 and 2017. You can email me at 
Centuries of Sound Mail at gmail.com. You can uh, find me on uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram. So we're going to finish off with uh, Dame Nellie Melba singing Goodbye. Do you know was, Dame Nellie Melba? She was famous for being a horrendously bad singer. No, she's not that bad singer. She is a good singer, I'd say. And uh, yeah, she. Oh, I'm thinking of something completely different then. She inspired uh, Melba Toast and Peach Melba. The uh, Escoffier created those dishes for her. And uh, Sydney Opera House was built for her, basically. So here's Dame Nelly Melba with Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.